Hello friends, uh, welcome to Be Waste Wise. I am Shweta Bindapani, I am the community builder at uh, Be Waste Wise and today in the panel we are going to talk about PFAS disposal in the United States. Like I was talking to our panelists today, I am sure uh, most of you in the United States are currently looking at the election results and the counting and what's going to happen. So uh, thank you for taking the time out to be part of this webinar. Before we go into it, I want to talk a little bit about Be Waste Wise and what we do. We are a nonprofit organization addressing the need for knowledge dissemination and waste management. We provide educational resources, direct access to experts and networking, and uh, we gently try to build a momentum around the global challenge of waste. Currently, we have been organizing two webinars every month on uh, several subjects surrounding waste, sustainability, sanitation, and the climate crisis at large. Uh, Today we have Cole Rossengren, who's a senior editor at Waste Dive. Uh, Cole has moderated another panel for us earlier this year. He has also been a panelist on other uh, webinars on Be Waste Wise. If you haven't seen them, please head to the video panel section on our website and you will find them there. He's going to talk to Ev Crunden, who up until yesterday was a reporter at Waste Dive, but in general, he is a reporter and a journalist. And... Uh, we did receive your questions, which have been passed on to both Ev and Cole. But uh, since this is a subject that uh, even I'm pretty excited to know more about, I'm sure you will have questions when the two of them are speaking. So do put down your questions in the Q&A section. Cole will pick them up as and when they come up and as and when they fit into the conversation at large. So over to you, Cole. All right. Thank you um, to Be Wastewise for the opportunity to speak today. And uh, good morning to everyone. Thanks for tuning in. For those um, who are not familiar, uh, Waste Dive is a, a news source. We're part of a company, Industry Dive, that does business news. Um, if you're interested, sign up for our free newsletters Monday through Friday, as well as on the weekends. And um, increasingly over the past, I'd say, year or so, um, especially since Ev started with us last year, um, the topic of PFAS has really risen to the forefront as one of the top issues um, that we're hearing about um, from folks in the industry, one of the top issues we're looking at going forward. And as folks may be aware, we recently put out a large uh, three-part series on this issue um, earlier this um, earlier last month. And uh, I would encourage folks to check it out if you haven't seen it already. Um, and that's going to inform sort of the framework of um, the questions we're looking at today and um, what we're exploring. Um, and I'll just say up front, we recognize this is a very complicated topic, um, a sensitive topic. Not everyone wanted to um, talk with us for the articles. It's, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty from a uh, regulatory standpoint, legal and financial. And so we're mindful of that. And we just ask on your end, um, recognize we do not have all the answers here. We're viewing this as a, you know, a co-learning experience and looking forward to hearing what you want to know. And if there's something we don't know, we'll mark it down and something to look at in the future. Um, and just one other note, as mentioned, um, unfortunately, Ev is, uh, has departed the Waste Dive team. We thank them for all their time on this. Um, but Waste Dive will continue to look, look at this issue. Um, I'll be the point person near term. And then, of course, um, Ev heading over to e, e News. You can read uh, their work over there. So to start it out, we expect a lot of folks on the webinar are probably familiar, but just to tee it up in case they're not, um, and uh, Sweta, feel free to get the slides going whenever you are able. Um, Ev, can you just walk us through briefly, what should we know about PFAS? Where, where is this, why is this coming into the waste stream? What products um, have it? Uh, what's going on here? Yeah, well, good morning, everyone. Well, good morning, US time. <laughs> um, uh, you know, so as Cole mentioned, um, you know, we've been, covering this issue for some time now. Uh, you may or may not be super familiar um, with PFAS. They're a pretty large family of chemicals. And so I don't know if you wanna to go to the first um, slide after this one. Yeah. Um, so essentially, you know, and this is kind of a, it's, it's a very wonky lengthy name. Um, you know, they're at least 4,500. I've seen more than, 5,000 um, different types of PFAS. Uh, they're toxic chemicals. Uh, they're known for their nonstick properties. Uh, so when you think of uh, nonstick pans, that's a really good example um, of an item that historically has had PFAS in it. Um, dental floss, uh, rain jackets, uh, they're in so many things. Uh, they're all around us. Um, you'll see them measured in parts per trillion a lot of the time, uh, that's PPT. 
uh, parts per billion, parts per million, uh, you'll see other forms of measurement. Um, so they're very, very diverse, uh, you know, different ways of looking at them and, and measuring them. Um, but what we do know about them is that several have been pretty definitively linked to a lot of health problems, uh, cancer probably being the most severe and, and disconcerting, um, but developmental issues, lots of other problems. And at this point, you know, they've been around for so long um, that they're pretty much in every human's blood. Uh, they've been detected, you know, in Arctic seawater um, all over the world. Um, a lot of concerns associated with them. And, you know, two of them, uh, PFOA and PFOS, uh, have actually been phased out of production in the US. Um, so a lot we don't know about PFAS, uh, some really disconcerting stuff that we do know. Uh, they are inevitable in the waste stream just because they're in so many products. And even, you know, PFOA, PFAS phased out, they're still in your waste. Uh, so this has become an issue that the waste industry is having to deal with uh, here, here in the US. And increasingly, you know, there are concerns. Um, I'm, a lot of you are probably following uh, the final election that we're having here <laughs> right now. Um, and that could really determine um, a lot of the trajectory uh, for PFAS for regulations. Um, the current administration does have um, a PFAS action plan uh, through EPA, but there hasn't been a lot of movement on the federal level around it. Um, a lot of criticism from environmental groups about that. Um, it's likely that were Joe Biden to become president, that would change. Um, I've spoken to many experts in the industry who say that could be, you know, a major space to watch uh, for people in waste. Um, you know, and then at the state level, 50 states, 50 different approaches, um, but we're seeing a pretty complex framework unfold around, you know, uh, drinking water is a big one, um, you know, groundwater, uh, surface water, Basically, you know, what what is the limit? How, how much can how many PFAS can be in there before it becomes a problem? Um, different states have different approaches, uh, but also issues, and we'll go into this in a little bit. Um, but food packaging uh, brings PFAS into compost. That's becoming an issue. Um, a triple F, which is firefighting foam, uh, has PFAS. That's another um, point where regulation has really focused. Uh, so it's becoming. I mean, in the last year since I really started focusing um, on this issue and, and how it's impacting waste, uh, it's just become an enormous problem. Yeah, it sure has. Um, from what we're seeing, it, yeah, we hear it come up more and more at um, industry events, of course. We know uh, industry groups, uh, SWANA, EREF, many others are doing research on this. There's a lot of attention ramping up here. Um, not to get too deep into the weeds, because as you say, there's so many different state and local regulations, but as part of this work, um, with the help of our uh, freelance researcher, Jacob, thank you, Jacob, um, can you just talk very broadly about the, the level of activity around, you saw around regulations um, at the state and local level in the past year, any kind of trends to call out there? Yeah, and I, it was hard, um, you know, this was, this, pro this project that, that we just published was months and months of reporting and uh, so much of the issue even down to the wire was figuring out where to focus um, even just in terms of sectors and then in terms of regulations and what to even track um, it was hard because you'll see you know even there's a kind of a more minor trend of banning PFAS in children's products for example um, but ultimately Based on different sectors uh, for waste, I think you know the water regulations are pretty notable, um, especially I think for air, the landfills uh, sector. Um, you know, drinking water obviously is not something you think of necessarily as being hand in hand with waste, but I, I did speak to several people who said, oh, you know, we see drinking water regulations and we think groundwater regulations, and then we think surface water regulations and down and down and down. And at that point it really hits our industry hard. Uh, so that's one, you know, and even I, when I was first looking into it, you had a few states, um, you'll see uh, the acronym MCL uh, fly around a lot. Uh, that's maximum contaminant level. Um, so that's, you know, for example, EPA has a, a health advisory of 70 PPT um, or parts per trillion for both PFO and PFOS. Um, and so you'll see some states have actually started 
kind of enshrining that. Um, so they'll, they'll set an MCL. Uh, it's getting kind of a race to the bottom. Uh, it's going lower and lower. Um, you know, a few states, uh, I'm trying to think, I feel like New York might have been one of the most recent um, to set their uh, drinking water standards. And you do see groundwater starting to crop up in different states. You do see surface water slowly beginning to make an appearance. So that's really gaining momentum. Um, and then you have, you know, kind of a kind of a different track, uh, which is the food packaging, uh, both, I believe, Washington and Maine, I want to say, um, have passed laws targeting uh, PFAS and food packaging. That one's gaining a little bit more momentum. There are several states considering that. Um, PFAS and biosolids, which we'll discuss, uh, that's becoming um, a big one. Um, only Maine, I believe, has actually banned uh, PFAS and biosolids when it's um, used as in land application, but that's one that the industry is closely watching. Um, and then I, I mentioned AFFF, uh, which is the firefighting foam, again, non-state properties. So you see PFAS in things that are, you know, meant to not burn and to repel all of these um, substances. So that's another one where we're seeing more and more legislation. Um, and that AFFF is major focus for a number of states and, and really cracking down on that. That's helpful to know. Um, we can go to the next slide, please. Um, so, and I'll say too, as we go through this, um, please feel free to put your questions in the uh, Q&A box. If you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll see that box and I will um, monitor that and we're happy to take questions as well. Um, and thanks to folks for questions ahead of time as well. We're working those in to our presentation. Um, one of the questions actually that came in ahead of time, I think is a good way to set up the organic section, which you alluded to before, Ev, is sort of why, you know, the question basically said, why focus on PFAS in compost or in organics? Because the alternative essentially is disposal and there are challenges there as well. And I think that's something we encountered a lot, um, you as you looked at your reporting and me as I worked, you know, helped you on the project to think about, there really is no, clear answer on, you know, it's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of hard choices. If it can't go one place, it has to go another place. Um, and it really is, has a universal effect. Um, what, what do you, what did you encounter as kind of the top line concerns and findings around what, why this is a big issue for organics suddenly? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Organics was, and I've, I've said this uh, to a lot of people at this point, I think this was one of the most fraught areas we wound up looking at just because I, they're facing really challenging and I think painful choices in the organic sector. And it's a sector where, you know, typically you feel really good about things like, you know, contributing to the environment, uh, combating climate change, uh, that came up a lot. And I talked to people and they just it really devastating um, what they're going through. And I think, you know, the, the focus on compost is because organics is such a big space uh, encompasses uh, multiple sectors, but with compost, you know, as I was looking at trends, um, you're know, seeing the ways in which this was impacting waste, impacting municipalities, uh, you know, more and more you see PFAS appearing in community compost and in cities kind of trying to deal um, with this problem. And, you, you know, if you like uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan uh, is one example, um, they found PFAS in the compost and they didn't, you know, it wasn't a situation where they like, oh, shut down the compost, um, but they were concerned. They released a lot of the data. It's publicly available. And as I was looking at that, and you know, findings in North Carolina, other places where this is coming up, um, they kept tracing back to food packaging, which this then becomes an issue. Um, you know, a lot of composting facilities already don't allow food packaging. Um, you know, there have been issues that have come up, um, kind of a complex space uh, for the sector, and the people who've really been moving on this um, BPI, the Biodegradable Products Institute, sorry, my cat keeps jumping in, um, which is why I'm kicking over there. Um, but, you know, BPI at the beginning of this year actually uh, stopped certifying products as compostable if they contain PFAS. Um, so I reached out to them, you know, to talk through that process and why that came up. And they, for years, have actually been working towards this. And, you know, there's a concern that if you give you know, any reason to not take the food packaging at your facility, uh, we'll just get added to the list um, just because it can already be kind of a tricky space um, for a lot of facilities. So really just a concern that 
this was going to be a crisis for compostable food packaging. Um, so they moved forward with forward with that. Um, you know, I flagged some of the regulations and you know, legislation that we're seeing around this. Uh, San Francisco um, really stands out as, um, I also I believe at the beginning of this year, um, they banned uh, PFAS in uh, compostable food packaging. So, you know, more and more, you see this kind of becoming an issue. Um, a lot of the concern around it being in food packaging is it's close to your food and then it's going in your body and it's bioaccumulative. Um, so people are, people are worried about that. And, you know, it's interesting because you see this problem emerging for compost and for, for food waste. And then you see what's happening to biosolids also in the organic sector. And I think the goal of everyone in sort of this more you know, food waste compost area is to not become what's going on in um, biosolids. Uh, the biosolid sector is really struggling with this. Um, you know, I think the inevitability of wastewater treatment plants. Um, I think someone at uh, Nebra, which is a uh, Northeastern um, biosolids group, and they talked to me pretty extensively for this series. Uh, very transparent about the problems that they've been having. Um, but you know, someone with Nebra basically told me there's no wastewater that doesn't have PFAS in it. Um, that means it's in biosolids, and you know, testing has largely confirmed that you just there's just no way it's not there. Um, and I think the fear, you know, what happened in Maine, um, I believe the, the impetus for Maine banning the biosolids land application with PFAS uh, was uh, the PFAS were discovered in milk from a dairy farm and they had traced that back to uh, the biosolids. And there's a panic, uh, they pretty quickly acted. And the fear is, you know, for, the sector that that's going to happen in other areas and you see already just just like you know nothing has actually happened in a lot of states uh, but just concerns have already led to pretty high costs um one example we highlighted and it's, it's on the slide as well uh concord new hampshire uh just the fear of you know regulations and, and getting into trouble uh they wound up sending their biosolids over the border now so they go to canada and that's a half a million dollar increase, um, especially at a time when municipalities don't really have a lot of money. Uh, we've got a pandemic going on, um, lots of issues there. So just in general, we're seeing this spiral. Um, we're seeing a lot of panicking, um, a lot of lobbying. You know, you've got Nebra, other organizations involved, really pushing back. Um, but just, I think there's a lot of fear and this will go into um, sort of the next sector and slide but you know if you can't you know do organics recycling essentially it's going to be sent to a landfill or sent to an incinerator and at that point you do have climate trade-offs um you do have other trade-offs and i think people in this space you know and and everyone has you know a lot of environmental organizations say well better to just get rid of it than expose people to pfas and People on the other end push back and they say, well, you know, this is going to really hurt a lot of other things that we're trying to do, like bring down emissions. Um, so, so it's pretty, it's pretty fraught, this, this conversation. Um, we can probably go into the next slide now. No, it sure is. And I think, um, yeah, the next area of um, incineration is obviously a clear example of how fraught it is um, in communities. As you point out, Ev, right, the goal, of course, in, for folks in the organic space is to find that beneficial reuse for their material, be it through compost or land application of biosolids, and that, you know, they, they do not want to see that material go to disposal um, in some cases, but we're not hearing about that happening at a wide scale yet, you know, just for context so folks know, but it's a possibility in certain cases. And for broader waste of all kinds, not just organics, you know, there is still that question of, okay, what is the, if there is, uh, it's decided that waste does need a, this kind of final safe disposal solution because it can, contains PFAS, where, where can it go? Um, and so, and, you know, incineration is one that we hear about, and this will kind of get into the, the trade-offs between the two. Um, and if we could actually go back one slide, please, to that. Um, so for this, obviously, we're hearing, you know, just general waste, you know, in certain regions, um, more more apt to go to these facilities, but also AFFF 
you know, is sometimes destined for these facilities, but as you say, quite fraught um, with controversy and just tough community relations and regulatory environment around this. Uh, what what set the stage for us about why, you know, why proponents think this is perhaps the safest option because of the high, high heat destruction, but also what why folks are worried about it maybe not being the case. Yeah, incineration, uh, uh, tricky and, you know, for, for non-US uh, viewers and listeners, um, you know, it might be a little different wherever you are. Um, in the US, it, you know, per the slide, uh, it's a smaller share of uh, disposal capacity here. Uh, it is notable uh, in some areas like the Northeast. Um, you know, this was an area two big events <laughs> happened around incinerating PFAS actually while I was reporting this, um, including one um, like as I was filing almost. Um, so it was, it was it pretty, uh, you know, per, per what Cole was saying, it, it's a bit of a fraught space. Um, you know, why we're even talking about incinerating PFAS is there are experts, a, num a number of people who do say it's safe, it's fine. Um, you know, I, the consensus seemed to be if you can, you know, if your facility can, can heat to at least a thousand uh, degrees, degrees C, then you, there's the possibility of destruction. Um, you know, the big issue, and we'll approach this a little bit with landfills, is, you know, how do you destroy something that was created to not be destroyed. You know, you'll, you'll hear PFAS referred to as forever chemicals because they don't break down. Uh, it's very hard to break them down. Sometimes when they break down, they break it down into other PFAS that can be even harder to deal with. Um, so the appeal of incineration for some people is this would be how we would actually destroy them, you know, get rid of them. Um, and I did, I did talk to people who do recommend that, uh, you know, to clients, uh, to whoever, um, a number of companies say they believe they can do it in their facilities. Um, you know, it's a lot of, I think, and this, this is the thing that really tied it all together is every single person I talked to said, oh, we need more research. EPA said we need more research. The company said we need more research. Environmental groups said we definitely need more research. Um, you know, we just don't know a lot about how you know PFAS behave in an incinerator, and the few studies we do have uh, have been funded largely by PFAS manufacturers, which you know if a lot of environmental groups say that's not enough for us, um, you know so that that's kind of why we talk about the space um, there you know especially for items like items, AFFF, however you would quantify AFFF, but uh, for, for the firefighting foam, um, you know, that has been the preferences, we're going to incinerate it. Um, PFAS are not um, regulated as hazardous waste in the U.S., um, which, you know, there are distinctions around hazardous waste incinerators versus um, just traditional, you know, municipal solid waste incinerators uh, that we kind of got into a little bit um, in the reporting process. And really, you know, the, the, two, <laughs> the two big incidents um, that came up uh, while I was reporting, the, the first um, in Cohoes, which is in New York, um, there was a professor um, and his students who did some testing around this facility um, operated by Norlight, uh, a company. And that company had an agreement um, with Department of Defense to incinerate a triple F because um, you know the military has a lot of foam they need to unload. And his professor found you know they the way they presented their findings you know they found all traces of PFAS all around the facility and said that you know the fingerprint of AFFF was all over there and the concern, so there's a public public housing complex uh, very close by, is this traveling through the air, it's getting to the ground, you know, it's really compromising these people. Um, you know, they presented their findings, um, sparked a lot of attention, uh, both on a local, state, and national level. Um, you know, the state, uh, the New York uh, Environmental Department pushed back on their findings, but is now conducting their own research. Um, so there's a lot of 
he said, she said, they said going on, um, but drew a lot of attention, um, really shut down incineration of PFAS in Cohoes. Um, a lot of community very upset, uh, a lot of pushback. Um, so that, that really highlighted the struggles around this um, and, and how you know fraught it can be. And then months later, it's a very similar situation uh, with some notable differences in Rahway in New Jersey, um, EPA had planned a test, um, you know, working with the state environmental department, um, working with um, this incinerator operated by Covanta. And the idea was to study how PFAS behave, you know, in this type of facility. And, and it's important to emphasize <laughs> that um, they weren't actually planning to take PFAS intentionally into the facility and, you know, incinerate it. But it was more, you know, they were going to study, they're going to introduce surrogate compounds, and then they were going to study those. And then there's, a, you know, as previously mentioned, um, there's PFAS in our waste constantly. So they were also going to study just the pre-existing PFAS, the stuff that's already coming into the facility, and just see how it behaved. And some of the same players, uh, Judith Inc, um, who is uh, quoted in the story, I spoke with her, um, she played a big role in presenting the Cohoes findings. She's a former um, regional administrator under the, for EPA under the Obama administration. Um, and she does a lot of work around um, PFAS and plastics these days. So she was involved in, she, she did learned about the test, um, got in touch with the community in Rahway, uh, including um, the local NAACP chapter, um, and let them know what was happening. Um, there was a lot of pushback. <laughs> and, you know, I think, I think to contextualize this for people who maybe aren't familiar um, with Rahway and with where waste sites in the U.S. tend to be, um, it's mm -hmm. a lot of low-income communities, communities of color, um, specifically uh, black communities um, in a lot of these areas. So perception by the community was you, you know, and what they, I think there was a sense that, oh, PFAS will be incinerated. And I don't think that was the actual intent, you know, it, it, no official has told me that was the intent, um, but you know, perception from the community was you are going to incinerate toxic chemicals where we live. Um, so they were very upset. They push back um, a lot of back and forth. Um, this, the test was canceled. Um, a lot of blaming um, EPA uh, really like singled out ink and blamed her. Um, New Jersey was critical of EPA, uh, you know, partisan differences, Republicans, Democrats, but also, you know, in favor of the study, um, unhappy it didn't happen. <laughs> um, the community was like, well, we want to battle, you know, you shouldn't do it here, you shouldn't do it anywhere. So very fraught, uh, lots of differences of opinion. Um, you know, since that time, and I, I've asked, you know, I asked EPA um, if they plan to do another test, uh, kind of big, I think, you know, there is again an agreement that more research needs to be done, how to safely do it, where to safely do it, um, very up in the air. And I think, you know, both of those examples, both in Cohoes and in Rahway, really underscore what a challenge it's going to be to do that research, just because, you know, you do need a facility, probably, to really figure out how it reacts or how they react in a facility. All of those facilities, for the most part, are going to be in communities that are going to be you know, very unhappy <laughs> with this happening uh, nearby. So, you know, the bottom line around incinerating PFAS is we just don't know a lot. Um, you know, some people recommend it, companies say they can do it, communities say we don't want you to do it here, EPA says we need more research. So it's a very, very controversial space. <laughs> Yeah, no, it is. Um, and as you noted, um, to one of the questions, yes, we are aware of the difference between um, hazardous and non-hazardous facilities, as pointed out, as noted in the story. And yes, and we recognize that there's a distinction in where, uh, what types of facilities can take this and how how that will be handled. So thank you for pointing that out, Jeremy. Um, heading in, just a reminder to folks, A, as we head toward the latter part of this, please feel free to keep adding questions to the Q&A box. Um, 
we're taking them as we go. We welcome your questions. Uh, and we can head into the next uh, slide, please. As we think about, you know, I would imagine, right, a lot of folks um, that we know have signed up and just a, just based on the the scope of um, facilities in the in the country, landfills are the big piece here, right? You know, in terms of just the number of them, uh, the quantities of waste handled and the potential for if for whatever reason, material that was going to other destinations that we've discussed cannot go there any longer. It all often comes back to the landfill. And so in thinking about this, you know, in brief of where to, to, it seems like, you know, from the story and from what we're hearing from folks, really, you know, the, the concerns around the leachate here and how to treat that and potentially where, where it goes, right? If um, uh, landfill sites are using offsite uh, treatment, which is certainly not uncommon, we're hearing more talk of folks trying to get more of that happening in house, but it's certainly expensive, right? To build that out. Um, what were some of the kind of top, top line findings here on landfills and what are some of the unanswered questions really that landfill operators are looking at from what you've heard? Yeah, so this, this I do going into um, this project and, and reporting on this, that this was going to take the most time and you know have the most components and be the most complex. Um, I think the bottom line is, you know, I like to caveat just in case, um, you know, say all, all landfills likely have PFAS, all landfills have PFAS in them. Um, you know, there's just no way just based on the waste stream and, you know, you just have so little control over what all is coming in. Um, you know, so this is a space that everyone's gonna have to deal with. And you see that reflected in, you know, every waste conference you go to uh, in the US probably has at least one, um, you know, PFAS session, if not more. Um, I've been to conferences virtually and in person where it was like five or six sessions because um, everyone's talking about it and everyone's worried about it. Um, you know, I think so many different themes emerged <laughs> as, I, as I was doing um, this research and, and talking to people. I think one interesting space, um, you know, we talked a little bit with organics about the wastewater treatment plants. Um, I would say they're some of the most vulnerable people uh, in the waste space just because not a lot of funding to begin with. And then this is going to be very, very expensive. Um, you, you see a lot of preemptive, you know, trying to avoid the problem. Um, some, you know, wastewater treatment plants are not taking leach it anymore because uh, because of PFAS. And um, I, you know, I think actually the, the interview and the anecdote that I wound up leading with uh, in the piece is from uh, this woman who she's the director for uh, Marathon County in Wisconsin under their salt waste department. And they, I think what they've been going through and then the costs that they've encountered, I think really encapsulate what the industry as a whole is kind of facing. Um, you know, she, had, she's part of this sort of informal um, solid waste group that formed last year, and they're seeking to combat negative perceptions around PFAS. They really want to underscore, you know, we receive this, we, we don't make it, we're not PFAS manufacturers, like we are trying to help you with your waste. And this has now become our problem. And, you know, we should be seen as a partner, um, you know, in dealing with this and, and not as you know, the culprit or, or the source of contamination. And when um, I talked to her, her experience with PFAS um, is, you know, they, I believe, I believe they have three landfills and they had um, you know, an agreement with, I want to say a paper mill. Uh, they took their leachate for years and uh, it was fine, you know, long, long, long running deep agreement. And then very abruptly, um, as Wisconsin started to eye cracking down on PFAS, um, really start scrutinizing where they're coming from, um, the sources. Uh, this uh, paper mill basically, you know, essentially said, oh, we, we don't want to be, you know, on the hook for this and reached out to the county and said, we're not taking your leachate anymore. Uh, and at that point, I think she bought herself nine months of extra time um, to try to figure out <laughs> where to send it. And, her, you know, in the process of, you know, finding a new recipient, um, trying to deal with it. Uh, her budget wound up going from, uh, I believe it's, yeah, 350,000 uh, to now over a million. So, 
very costly, um, very stressful experience um, for her, for her department, um, came at the expense of a lot of other, you know, things that they would have been focusing on and funding. And she became very active on this issue because, you know, she's seen this happening um, in other parts of the country. So we see that kind of <laughs> unfolding um, in a number of areas, um, you know, similar cost issues, similar concerns. I think there's a sense from municipalities that they're being hit hard without a lot of help. Um, you know, you see regulations, legislation really mounting, but, you know, not a lot have really built in who's going to pay for this, um, you know, who's going to do the cleanup, who's going to do the treatment, who's going to do the mitigation, and, you know, very cash strapped municipalities are like, well, you know, oh. um, so, you know, you see that unfolding on the one hand, um, you know, I think Cole mentioned at the beginning, um, we struggled to get a lot of the really big public companies to talk to us <laughs> for this piece. Um, I have, I sent so many emails and made so many phone calls just to try to get people uh, to engage with me a little bit, um, you know, and, so, and some and some did, um, but, you know, for the most part, I really had to rely on public records requests and financial filings just to get an indicator of, you know, who's talking about this and how are they feeling about it. And if you go into Waste Management Republic, um, a lot of the big players here, um, their filings, you know, you can see that they're talking about PFAS, that they're worried about them, um, that this is becoming an issue. You know, there is some question around, well, you have to get rid of um, these chemicals and the waste containing them. Could landfills and could these companies play a role? Like possibly. Um, but at the same time, you know, the risk factor is just so big and the concerns are so many. Um, so over and over again, you'll see it cited um, as a source of concern. And, you know, saw that over and over again, um, you know, and I know there have been questions about um, solutions and treatments and everyone really wants an answer. Uh, they really want something they can do. That's completely understandable. Um, I spent so much time talking to people, trying to figure out, you know, how do you deal with this? And I regret to say <laughs> that we don't really have, um, you know, a cut and dry solution. Um, you know, part of why uh, incineration is such a question is again, you just don't really have a proven method of destruction. So, you know, people are really trying to figure out what do you do with toxic chemicals that are inevitable that you can't destroy. Um, you know, I think sort of the emerging Spaces, areas of increasing interest, um, and with the caveat that I'm, I'm not an engineer, I'm not a chemist, and I <laughs> wish I could give more detailed answers on some of these. Um, but you know, uh, I, on the slide, um, granular activated carbon, um, JC, uh, IX is ion exchange, and RO is reverse osmosis. Those were three different treatments that came up a lot um, when I talked to people. Um, you know, I most people for telling me you need to combine typically, you know, several when you're dealing with waste that contains PFAS. Um, there are so many other uh, technologies and approaches and treatments um, and a lot of experts doing some really cool work on, you know, different ways that you can approach this um, specifically with a leachate angle, obviously, you know, a lot of the investment outside of waste has been, you know, how do you get PFAS out of drinking water? Um, it's very hard to get PFAS out of waste that already has so many other things in it. Uh, so you're dealing with something that, you know, you've got like ammonia, you've got, there's a lot in there. Um, so that's been a struggle for a lot of landfill operators, um, for a lot of people in the space. And you know, even as these treatments are emerging, I think the number one thing you need to realize is it can be very expensive <laughs> and you could be paying a lot of money and still have PFAS you need to, you know, send back to a landfill because you just can't destroy it. It's still there. Um, you know, and I get, you know, emails from people every day marketing their latest PFAS solution treatment. Um, I cannot give you my assessment of what would be best. Um, you know, some seem to work better than others. Um, you know, lots of companies 
cropping up out there uh, that are working on this, uh, that want to partner with waste operators um, on it. But, you know, again, going back to Marathon County in Wisconsin, um, you know, they were telling me, yeah, we have lots of people reaching out about this, but ultimately cost and, you know, you could be spending millions of dollars and it's still going to be there and, and you're still going to have to dispose of it. So I know that's very uplifting for everyone, um, but, you know, it's still, still remains in limbo. Um, there's a lot of emerging research. Um, there's a lot, you know, Suwana, Uref, um, Cole mentioned uh, looking closely at this. Um, you know, it's, it's again, it's a high priority. I mean, the waste industry wants a solution. Um, most people were telling me five to seven years before we really have um, an effective technology that can deal with it, but there are people working on it. It is rapidly advancing. We just don't really have what we need yet. Um, you know, and while all of this is unfolding, the regulations are unfolding. Um, and we had gotten to that a little bit earlier, but you know, at the state level, you have this very complex regulatory framework that's unfolding. Um, you know, targeting PFAS, especially, I mean, for landfills, we really focused on water. Um, and to like contextualize, I spent maybe six or seven months just reporting and writing this. And in that time, I kept having to go back and add a new state that had introduced a regulation or a new piece of legislation. Um, I was constantly updating. I think even the week we published, I was <laughs> messaging Cole to say, oh no, there's another one. Um, so this is moving very quickly. Um, that's all at state level. At the federal level, it's been pretty stalled. Um, bringing this back to the election we're currently having, uh, that could change imminently. So I think that's a huge space to watch. I think so. And I think that's a good segue into our last slide. Um, and just a reminder to folks in our, our remaining minutes here, um, please feel free to write in with questions. Um, in going to that last slide and looking at what's ahead of um, thinking about, uh, you know, as, as we keep working on this, that's, you know, the contact info for waste app. I guess I should give you the opportunity of before we wrap up, you know, what, um, how, how can folks reach you in your new role now as you continue working on this? Yeah, um, you know, you can reach out to me at um, ecrunden at eenews.net. Um, it'll be at the ENE News website. Uh, we'll have my contact information. Um, some of you probably already interact with my Twitter account. <laughs> um, so that I'll also um, be sharing my email pretty regularly on there, um, but I'll still be following PFAS. Um, I'm actually now gonna be mostly reporting on PFAS. Uh, so this, this project kind of led me <laughs> to this new role. Um, so sad to be leaving uh, Waste Dave and Cole. Um, but I think we'll both, uh, both WaveDev and E&E &E will be covering this a lot. Um, so, you know, especially if the regulations are about to gain momentum, I think those are two publications you can follow. Yeah, just a quick, you know, last question on that. Again, we, we don't know, but for as far as what, you, what you've heard, if, as it appears potentially, you know, that we do see a possible Biden administration, um, of course, we won't know what happens with the Senate for some time, but what have you heard from folks about what, if there is a change at the very least at the, you know, at the White House level, what, what could that mean in how, in terms of how this issue is handled differently federally, or is it too soon to know? Yeah. So I, you know, and it's, it's so hard to say, I think, um, you know, everything in this country is defended on multiple branches of government. Um, so per what Cole was saying with the Senate, I think as far as legislation goes, that could be an uphill battle. Um, there are a number of bills currently sitting that have not moved. And based on the current trajectory, I don't know that they're gonna move in the next few years. Um, that's very different for the White House, especially when we start seeing, um, you know, cabinet appointments, um, EPA will change dramatically. It has been a very deregulatory, EPA under Trump, and it would not be under Joe Biden. So I think, you know, I talked to so many people who said, oh, this is a space to watch uh, if the administration changes. I think we will see very drastic differences. Um, you know, I don't know that it's a day one priority, but like a day 20 priority, probably. Um, you know, there's a lot of momentum here. Um, there's a lot that we're likely to see. I think as far as setting an MCL, which has been a big point of contention, um, 
no one I've talked to said we shouldn't expect to see an MCL for PFAS out of a Biden administration. That would have huge implications for the industry. So I think that's a space to watch. Interesting. Okay, that's good to know. Um, well, thanks again to Be Wastewise for the opportunity um, to speak today. And for anyone whose question we didn't get to, please feel free to follow up um, with us by email or you know, or with Be Wastewise. And then Swait, I'll turn it back to you. Uh, thank you, Cole. Thank you, Ev. Uh, I mean, thanks a lot for this detailed webinar. I, we could actually see the months of work that went into reporting your extensive series. So uh, reminder to everyone, please head to the Waste Dive website. You will see the detailed stories and you should be reading them. Um, uh, I think both Cole and Ev shared the email IDs they'll be available at. In case you miss that, you could always write to us at connectedwastewise.b and we will ensure we connect you to them. And Cole will be moderating more webinars for Be Wastewise. So sign up to our newsletter as well to, and you will be updated whenever uh, a webinar comes up and uh, that's it. Have a good day. Good evening, wherever you're at. Bye-bye. Thank you everyone. Bye. Thanks everyone.